The Apostle Paul wrote these amazing words. He said, if I could speak in all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. This is God's word for us today. So a little confession this morning. Um, when I was 12, uh, my close friend, his name was Jeff Gorbold, had a three-speed Stingray bicycle with a banana seat. And I wanted one, badly. <laughs> Badly. It even had a stick shift on it. It was amazing. It was amazing. So it's called envy or jealousy. And it starts young, doesn't it? More than anything else, more than impatience, more than unkindness, more than apathy or anger, I think envy will kill a friendship very, very quickly. As I said before, we're continuing in our discussion of, of the characteristics of love that, that God gives us, his, his perfect love and the, the love he wants us to experience with each other, with our relationships with the, each other. And the Apostle Paul wrote these words. He says, love does not envy. It's impossible to envy someone and love them at the same time. Think about that. Well, let's find a definition for envy to go with this morning. What is it? Envy is resenting God's goodness to others, and it's ignoring God's goodness to me. Let's think about that. It's resenting God's goodness to others, and it's ignoring God's goodness to me. James 3.16 says it this way. He says, uh, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you, will, there you find disorder and every evil practice. One author I was reading made a list of the problems that he uh, sort of translated from, from, from envy. These are a list of the things that go on in people's lives because of envy. Uh, anorexia. People starve themselves because they envy thin people. Adultery. People envy someone else and their spouse, so they steal them. Bitterness. That's when I resent people because I, I, I envy things that I wish that I had achieved. Dishonesty and exaggeration. People overstate their accomplishments out of envy. Gossip. Uh, we tear other people down so we feel better about ourselves. That's envy. Manipulating. Because we envy, we scheme and use others to get our own way. Even murder, the very first murder in the Bible that's recorded in, in history was between Cain and Abel. And you know the reason why? It was envy. It was envy between the two brothers. Proverbs 14.30 gets a little bit more graphic about it. it. He says envy is like bone cancer. It'll eat you alive. It starts on the inside and makes you miserable. At the heart, it, it goes like this. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. That's how Solomon described it. Is envy worth it? Is envy worth it? When we're able to be objective, we, of course, know that it's not. It's not. As I said earlier, it destroys friendships faster than almost anything else. It can destroy families by 
sibling rivalry. It can destroy businesses. It can destroy neighborhoods. It even causes nations to go to war with each other simply out of envy. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that's one destructive attitude, isn't it? That's a very destructive attitude. But here's the truth. We're affected by it all the time because retail advertisers thrive on feeding our envy, don't they? They do. That's one of their weapons that they use. So, so if it's that destructive, then how do we root it out of our lives? How do we root it out of our lives? Matthew 20, we find a parable that Jesus wrote that I really never liked, to tell you the truth. It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one to hear. Jesus tells us the story of some people who did it the wrong way, and they became very, very envious. Let me just summarize the first part of it for you, and then we'll read the rest. It's about a farmer who goes out and hires some workers. He starts out with the workers that he hires at the start of the day, and then he goes out four more times during the day and hires some others. To the first ones, he says, I'll pay you a set wage. And the con contracted amount was a dollar a day, which was the going rate at that time. And to the others, he hires those for some part of the day. And, and he says, I'll pay you what's fair. They don't even agree on, a, on an amount. They're just trusting him to be fair. And at the end of the day, he decides to pay them in reverse. And he decides, I'm going to pay everybody the same amount. He didn't pay the people who worked all day any more than the people who just worked an hour at the end of the day. He gave them all a full dollar. What made them upset and the other people were, were given, th that the other people were given what they felt like they didn't deserve. So they became very, very, very envious. And you know what? If I were in that circumstance, I probably would have too. I probably would have too. And I'm presuming probably most of us, the rest of us would have too. We would try to play the, well, that's not fair card on, on the whole situation. Well, let's kind of tease out what Jesus was teaching us in that story. I think the first thing that Jesus was teaching, if you want to root envy out of your life, stop comparing yourself to others. Stop comparing yourself to others. That's hard to do because... I think comparing is at the root of almost all envy. Comparing was the very first mistake made by these workers. In verse 10, we read, it says, those hired came up, those hired last came up, and each were given a dollar. And when those who were hired first saw that, they assumed that they would get far more. When the all-day group watched the part-day group get paid first, they probably thought, look what they're getting. We work so much more, so we're going to get more. We deserve more. We ought to have more. And Jesus is warning us against comparing ourselves to everybody else, to anybody else. It's foolish. Don't compare the way you look. Don't compare your car, your house, your clothes, or any of your stuff. Don't compare your income or your intelligence. Don't compare your kids. Don't compare your husband or your wife. That's really dangerous. Or your job. Or anything else. Why? I mean, it just seems so natural to compare. I mean, we're just wired that way, aren't we? I think there's at least three compelling reasons why. The first one is that comparing forgets about your uniqueness. Comparing forgets your uniqueness. God made you special. God made you uniquely. There's nobody like you. He made the mold, and then he broke it. You can't be compared to anyone else. Your life was never intended to look like anyone else's. It doesn't mean that we can't grow in our abilities. This does not mean we're complacent about life. We don't strive to grow so we can be like someone else. We want to be the all God created us to be. We want to be the person that God created us to be. The second reason why we don't compare is comparing leads to either pride or envy, either one. When you start comparing yourself, the, the way you look or the kind of stuff you have, you start comparing and you think, hmm, well, I'm doing better than them. What's that called? 
That's pride, isn't it? Or you say, wow, they're doing better than me. And that's envy. That can lead to envy. Neither are helpful. And both are very destructive. And Jesus says both are absolutely wrong. So God says stop comparing it. Don't do it because it's always going to lead to one or the other, pride or envy. <clears throat> A lot of times when we envy people, we just don't know the whole story behind their success. If we knew their background, if or they knew what sacrifices they made to get where they are, if we knew the pain or hurt that they've gone through, we absolutely might not want it. We might not want it. We don't know the whole story. I remember in my first years of the business world when I was in public accounting, my early public accounting years, one, as the assignments were sort of, at least in my mind, randomly uh, distributed throughout the, the offices, um, one of my coworkers uh, was assigned to the glamour cli client of our office, or at least it seemed like that to me. He was privileged to travel all the way to get this Cedar Rapids, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> for about half the year. <laughs> that was the glamour client. <laughs> and I remember really envying his assignment. Bruce moved up the ladder very quickly and was transferred with a promotion to another office. He got all the breaks. At least I thought he did. Later, after he moved, I found that his success, though, had come at a very high cost because Bruce lost his marriage. It was a very high price to pay. Other times, we can envy another person, but later we find out they have a whole set of challenges in their life that we would never trade with them for. God has promised to give you the grace to handle your challenges every single day. And when we take time to get to know people, let's not envy them. Let's love them. And most importantly, let's pray for them. That's where the power is. One other thing that comparing does is that it kind of has this assumption built into it. When we compare, we assume that, that, that life is fair, whatever that means, fair from our standpoint, that is. Intellectually speaking, we know that life is never going to be fair. We tell our kids all the time in our limited way of looking at it, but somehow, <coughs> excuse me, our minds forget and we shift into that comparing mood. Remember, some of us are born in Bangladesh, some are born in Hawaii, some are born in Uganda, some are born, you just name it. Some of us live in dry heat, some of us live in humid heat. That's where I was last week. That was, that, some of us have health issues that we deal with due to our genetics. Nothing we ever did. Some of us are born into families with lots of resources, and some are blessed to grow into families where we have to learn to rely on God's goodness every single day. Some of us live in places where it's illegal to be a Christian, and others of us live in a place where there's different challenges to our faith. All of this is just to remind us that the world is not all, this world is not all that there is. I don't ever want to mem minimize the difficulties people are going through, the challenges, the horrible persecutions, the personal battles that, that, that we face. Yet we know that our challenges help us to learn that we need God. We need God. They help us to remember that our lives here are just a small part of eternity. Second principle I think Jesus is teaching us in this parable is to start enjoying God's gifts to others and God's gifts to you. When we see God as being kind, as Pastor Steve said last week, kind and good and gracious to others, and learn to, we can learn to enjoy it rather than to resent it. We need to be happy when God is blessing somebody else, and that does not come naturally always. We have to learn to rejoice when others are blessed. That's the exact opposite of what these workers did in the, in the parable, and it's what we often do too. The all-day workers were paid exactly what they contracted they for, what, what, the, what the farmer contracted with them for. They weren't cheated. They just resented other people being given just as much. 
Instead of enjoying it, the workers resented it. Jesus goes on and says, So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius, or a dollar as we're calling it today. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. He said, Are you envious because I am generous to them? Romans 12, 15 says it this way, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Sometimes I think the second half of that verse is a little easier to do than the first half. It's easy to weep with those who weep. It's easy when someone is down, they're down on their, they're, 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 they're hard up on their, on their luck. They've had a tough time. It's easier to be sympathetic and to, and, and to share their hurts and the pains and the sorrows. It's much more difficult to rejoice, I think, when they have success. Often we don't handle success of other people very well. We're threatened by it. We say, why them? Why them? It's very interesting that when we have success, we, er we, we rarely ask, why me? Why me? It's because I know the answer, of course. I deserve it. I deserve it. Somehow in our minds, I think we think that the world is this big, giant raspberry pie. You might think of it, and it's all divided up into slices. And if somebody gets a slice that's a little bit bigger than others, that means that my slice is going to be smaller. But that's the wrong image. That's the wrong image, because God's got all the pie filling there is in the world. Think about that. Think about that. God doesn't ever run out of blessings. He doesn't run out of grace. There's more than enough to go around because God blesses someone does not mean that there's not enough blessing for you. He just wants to do it in a different way. Some have better health than others. Some have public achievements and others don't. Some have strong family relationships and others have difficult family relationships. Some have the blessing of less hair. And others have the curse of having to comb and brush it all the time. <laughs> See? When we're blessed in different ways, we need to learn to rejoice in the joy of other people. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, he said, I have learned to be content. Now we want to focus on that word content in that word, but in, in that passage, but I, it struck me that there's another key part of that. It's the learned part. It's the learned part. It was a learning process. It's not a natural thing. So instead of complaining like these workers did about what they didn't get, we learn to realize that we would not have anything without God. Anything without God, without his goodness and with all that he's given to us. And that leads us to the third observation from this parable it's more of an admonition to all of us. Keep on trusting God's plan even when life seems unfair. One of the signs of envy in our lives is the language that we use. If you find yourself starting to use the phrase, it's not fair, I think you've fallen into the trap. I've worked as hard as they do. I'm a committed Christian. And we start getting into that earning thing, don't we? Maybe if I just worked more, maybe if I just went to church more, maybe God would bless me more. And we know that that's not what it's about. We need to trust God, and he knows exactly what each individual life needs. He knows the hurt, he knows the pain, he knows the blessing that each life can handle. We trust God in that, don't we? In the story today that Jesus told, the all-day workers felt like they were being treated unfairly, not because they weren't paid what they were promised. They were paid exactly what they were promised. But the part of the day, people were paid the same amount when they thought, well, we did, we worked more, we're better. Verse 12 says, these last workers have put in one easy hour, and yet you have made them equal to us. You can hear the envy in that. That's the message paraphrase added that, that easy word there. You hear the envy in that, and, and 
he goes on and says, We who slaved all day under a scorching sun. Notice the owner's reply in the next verse. He says, Friends, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give to the one who came the last, the same as you. Can I do what I want with my own money? The bottom line is, when I'm envious, I'm not in a battle with that other person. I'm really in a battle with God. I'm really in a battle with God. My problem isn't with that other person. My problem is with God. I'm doubting God's goodness in my life. I'm resenting God's decision to bless someone else differently. So let's get real personal. Do you ever envy? Do you ever envy? I do. I catch myself doing that. Here are some subtle signs. Are you a scorekeeper? Are you a scorekeeper? She got more than I did underneath the Christmas tree. <laughs> Ever heard that one before? At work. Wow, he has a better workspace than I do. Don't do that. Don't do that. Be grateful. Yeah. You ever have the half-empty attitude? That's saying that other people, some people see the glass half full and others see it half empty. Another way of stating that thing is that some people look at the glass and say, who took my water? <laughs> others are saying, well, who gave me this water? Who gave me this water? Be grateful. God did. You ever find yourself with the, the gotta have it at all costs? Got to have it. That's one pretty self-explanatory. Or you find yourself with a critical spirit, always finding fault in other people, tearing them down so that you can lift yourself up. Or are you a poor loser? Go to a Little League baseball game. Watch the parents. <laughs> Even when it comes to the latest sales contracts or whatever. Isn't it time to move on? Be grateful. We have a choice. We have a choice. And this choice makes all the difference in our whole life perspective. We can choose envy, and that begrudges the blessings and successes of others, and it asks, why them and not me? Or we can choose gratitude. Gratitude. And it recognizes and appreciates God's blessings and instead of, instead of asking why them, we humbly ask, why me? Why me? I have been so blessed. Just join me right now in a word of prayer. Just take a moment to think about your life. If any of those signs that we just listed off are, are present right now, <clears throat> I pray that, God, that, that uh, we would just confess those to you and, and we would realize how, how blessed we are, how amazing and how good you are, God, and that you're here to, to fill our cups. You're here for us to be humbly in your service so that not only do we serve you but we serve others in the same way you don't have a short supply of grace God your grace is more than sufficient it's more than sufficient it's the, it's the fuel we run on every single day so God help me to open my heart open my life allow you to fill me up with that grace so that I can be a dispenser of grace to others in the same way. Teach me to serve others and love them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.